uh, in more detail about the uh, the chapter we are primates in our textbook um, we talked about different parts of this chapter in terms of thinking about new world monkeys and old world monkeys and apes and some of the different classifications and types of non-human primates that we uh, see in the world. This is, uh, I think the most important part of the chapter for me is simply the title. Uh, we are primates by we meaning, meaning human beings are part of the primate order. So if anyone ever says, I don't understand how humans evolved from primates, you just say, aha, no, that's not true. We too, human beings, are primates. So we evolved within the primate order. And the person who, who sort of classified human beings in the primate order, this larger primate order, uh, was Linnaeus, who is responsible for that kingdom phylum genus thing that we all have to learn. Um, he, Linnaeus, interestingly, if you look at uh, his uh, um, citing from a page number in Muckle and Gonzales, which we haven't gotten to quite yet, we'll talk about this in, uh, in the next time in terms of evolutionary theory, Linnaeus, you might notice, lived and died before Darwin ever came along. Linnaeus was a creationist. He believed that he was classifying creatures. His scheme was a classification scheme that was equivalent to what he thought was the divine order. So um, in some ways, it's interesting because even uh, Linnaeus and other Europeans were able to see the similarities between the human primates and the non-human primates as they started to come into contact more uh, with uh, creatures across the, the natural world. And, and that's the reason uh, we're classified uh, in the order of the primates. So why does Linnaeus classify human beings among the primates? And here I want to talk about some of the, the general characteristics of the large primates. So we're not talking here about the lemurs and some of the tiny primates that are part of the order, but what are called the haplorini, uh, and some of the general characteristics that we see across uh, the, the larger apes and, and monkeys that we that we classify as primates. One of the one of the things that we share across our the the large primates is that we have uh, grasping hands and feet. So the fact that we have an opposable thumb is something that is shared with, uh, for example, chimps and and um, and bonobos and baboons. It may be particularly developed among human beings. We don't actually have grasping feet as much. Uh, some of us are better at that than others, uh, but we definitely share uh, what, you know, the, the thumb is opposable. Uh, we also have, uh, we have fingernails. We do not have claws. So this is something that we, uh, we, we, we share with uh, an, our primate cousins. Also, we have stereoscopic vision. That is, our eyes are frontally oriented so that we see uh, in, in, in 3D. Um, and one of the things that, that this does is that in general, as the primate species, uh, as it evolved, there was a reduction of the facial projection. That is to say, the, the faces become flatter. Um, and what this means is uh, most primates have better sight, but a lot of them can't smell very well. So evolution always involves trade-offs and, you know, species like dogs can smell amazingly. Uh, we're usually, you know, we smell things, but not on the order, not, not in the way that other uh, creatures can smell. So in general, kind of across the primate development, uh, we traded in a better sight or or a 3D vision, uh, a reduction of facial projection so we could get better sight and traded away our smell. Across the primates, there's, uh, in relation to our body size, uh, bonobos, chimps, gibbons have large and complex brains. So this is something that we share. Uh, of course, it's particularly developed among humans, uh, but it's true of across the uh, larger primate order. We usually have single infants, uh, sometimes twins, but that's 
more occasionally. We don't have large litters of, of, of infants. So it's usually single infants and there's usually a very long period of infant dependency. So among chimpanzees, bonobos, um, among the orangutans, you know, the, 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 the child, the, the child might be dependent on parents, mothers for six or seven years. Among human beings, about 35 years. So there's a long period of infant dependency uh, that happens with the primates. Our infants are very dependent on, on us for, they're, they're, they're not very independent at all. Most of the large primates are diurnal, that is they're active in the daytime. Uh, and uh, most of them are also arboreal or adapted to life in the trees. Uh, we see some that uh, become more, more adapted to life on the ground. Uh, but over the course of, of evolution, uh, a lot of that, a lot of the primate evolution happened in the trees. So this is the, these are some of the reasons that Linnaeus and other classifiers said that humans are part of the primate order. What we see when we look at uh, the primates is a tremendous amount of diversity and flexibility. And so, you know, one of the reasons I've been naming all these different species of primates and talking about uh, their different habitats and, and where they are is just to give you a sense of how, how much uh, variety we see among the order. There's not some sort of biological imperative which marks all of the primates. We see variation in terms of the way uh, primates move from place to place. We see social variability in terms of their groups and patterns in which they, uh, in, in which they, uh, they congregate. There are some groups that are male dominated, but there are others that are relatively egalitarian and there, there are others that are female dominated. So we see uh, that there is not one single social order among the primates. Uh, different uh, primate groups uh, have, have different, uh, different mating patterns, as well as different ways of forming friendships and relationships. So we see a lot of different ways in which uh, primates relate to each other. Again, I'm trying to stress that uh, there's not sort of one, one thing that we can say, okay, well, that's where humans got their tendency to, be, uh, to, be, to, to mate. Um, we see a, a number of different ways uh, even among the non-human primates in which they socialize. There's also dietary variability, which uh, may come as something of a surprise. Uh, Michael and Gonzalez mentioned that there's frugivory, folivory, and insectivory. Insectivory is probably obvious, but uh, also, so folivory is leafy and frugivory is fruity. And what's uh, kind of fascinating here is that you know, there's, it's not that there's one diet which you have for all time. Uh, the primates can switch between being frugivory or fruiting, folivory or being uh, more foliage oriented and being more insectivory. And it can vary over time and, and what's sort of more available in the environment. As anthropologists, why are we interested in studying non-human primates? So we'll be talking about this in, in the next uh, few classes, but non-human primates give us ideas about, you know, what our most recent common ancestors, when we go back six, seven or eight million years ago, what they might have behaved like, what they might have uh, looked like uh, is something that we can get from studying the non-human primates of today. They also give us clues to our human behavior. Now, I've, I've, in both of, these, uh, both of these segments, I want to emphasize that this is giving us clues. These are, not, uh, these are not things that we're going to be able to discover the source of or the determining influence, because like I said, there's a huge range of diversity uh, among the primate uh, population. So what we're really looking for are parallels, uh, but we're not necessarily going to find the answer to how humans behave. 
Buckling Gonzalez also mentioned that uh, looking at non-human primates and remember their, one of their themes is food and one of their themes is sustainability. It turns out that uh, in, in some of the forested areas, uh, the non-human primates can be very important for forest conservation. Uh, since they move around a lot, they can spread seeds to different places. And we can also learn about how uh, primate populations are able to support themselves in terms of their food and their food variability over time. So this is also something that we can get from uh, non-human primates. So I want to here mention, as uh, Michael and Gonzalez do, some of the main people who have uh, been the, at the forefront of primatology. Of course, Jane Goodall is perhaps the most famous primatologist studied among the, uh, the chimpanzees in Gombe, Diane Fossey, uh, Gorilla Barute Galdicas, and also I'll add in Barbara Smuts, who we read. One of the things you might notice about these people is there are a lot of uh, women uh, a lot of female primatologists, and they were some of the pioneers really in finding out uh, things about our uh, closest relatives. Uh, Goodall was the first to observe tool use among chimpanzees, uh, sort of an ex exciting moment that, you know, basically uh, overturned people's ideas that only humans were able to use tools. Uh, so, you know, women have been pioneers in, uh, in our findings in primatology, and I want to mention how important that has been to our understanding of, of the, the natural world. Talked about this before, but just again to emphasize that what we find is there is variation among all the many different species of primates, uh, that they are very diverse, and that they, uh, they we, we're very flexible. We, uh, can adapt to different environments. There's also variation by groups, as we discussed with the gorillas and other groups, as well as individual variation. So, you know, primates have personalities. Some are more aggressive than others, even within the same species. You see this, uh, you see individual variation, just like we do in our own species. So, We'll be talking more about this as we go into evolution, but you know, when it comes to the clues to our most recent common ancestor, I do want us to keep in mind that when we look at contemporary, contemporary populations of chimpanzees or of bonobos or of gorillas, that they have also been evolving over time. So it's not simply that humans evolved and that chimpanzees were stuck where they were six million years ago. The chimpanzees of today have also been evolving for six million years. So, you know, they are, uh, they're going to be perhaps like our most recent common ancestor, but they might be different too. So we have to be very careful, you know, not to think that somehow certain creatures evolve and others just get stuck in evolutionary time. All creatures have been evolving uh, at all, all this time. And as I mentioned before, uh, there's another speciation event, another uh, sort of uh, evolutionary divergence that happens after the divergence between uh, the lineages that would lead to bipedal uh, homo species and the lineages that would lead to uh, the common, what is called the common chimpanzee and the bonobo. So there are things that, you know, I mean, are, is, are, are the common ancestors of humans, chimps and bonobos more like chimpanzees or more like bonobos? Uh, it's probably difficult to speculate on that because we have a speciation event which happens after uh, the divergence between these three species. Non-human primates also offer these clues about, you know, the, the behavior and how we might be alike or how we might do things, uh, do things that are similar. We can look for uh, you know, things like family structure, or gender roles. We can think about, well, do, do other non-human primates uh, have these uh, similar kinds of ideas? But I would, you know, caution us against the idea that humans are simply uh, apes with the, the, without hair, or what has been called the naked ape. 
uh, as we'll talk about in our archaeology unit, uh, it's not humans use tools, uh, but we use very durable tools and we reshape our landscape uh, much more than other creatures. And we've been doing that for uh, over 2 million years. So, you know, I mean, obviously we want to look at uh, other species for ideas about how we behave, but we don't want to fall into the trap of thinking that we are simply uh, hairless apes. Uh, we've been evolving uh, quite differently for the last uh, two to three million years at least, or six to eight million years if you want to go back further. So uh, one of the species that uh, the Magongzas discuss are the bonobos, perhaps not as familiar to us as the chimpanzees. One of you put in the discussion board that they, you were more interested in the chimpanzees, and yes, they tend to be uh, more aggressive and use more tools. Uh, the bonobos have a very different uh, form of social life. They tend to be more egalitarian. Uh, they tend to have uh, uh, people sometimes, uh, they tend to be uh, less aggressive, less violent, tend to use uh, more sex in, ter in terms of a way of uh, diffusing tensions around food sharing. So there's a short uh, video segment that I'm going to send to you that will give you a sense of uh, some of the bonobo behavior just because it's uh, kind of interesting and they're equally uh, relevant to us, uh, evolutionarily related. Um, but I will say, it's about a five minute segment. I'm going to send that to you instead of trying to screen share on, on Zoom as that kind of backfired for me. So I'll send you